Hey everyone, this is Chad Schwartz from Lehigh Gap Nature Center joining you virtually today. And the topic for this video is history. So we're going to be going back in time and taking a look at how the Lehigh Gap area has changed through the years. And we'll talk a little bit about Native American history and colonial history, uh, but most of this video is going to focus on the fact that the Lehigh Gap area looked like the moon for many years. And if you've been in the area long enough, I'm sure you remember that already, but uh, maybe you're too young to remember that, or maybe uh, you're not from the area and this story is new to you. Uh, and if that's the case, no problem. We're going to have lots of pictures all throughout this video that do show how the land has changed over the years. I will also be explaining, of course, why the land looked like the moon in the first place. And then I'll talk about how Lehigh Gap Nature Center has been working really hard for the past 20 or so years to bring our section of that moonscape back to life. Okay, so lots of ground to cover. Uh, let's get started real quick by introducing a word that you'll be hearing throughout this video. That word is on the screen right here, Superfund. We went from Superfund to Super Habitat, or sometimes I like to say Superfund, because we have lots of fun programs these days. So Superfund, uh, a Superfund site is an area of land that is impacted by some sort of pollution. And it's the federal government, the Environmental Protection Agency, that establishes these sites. There's a law that was uh, introduced back in the 1980s called CERCLA uh, that actually started the, the Superfund program. Um, but in our case, there's a, about 3,000 acres of land uh, that includes a section of the Nature Center property, as well as the whole area around Palmerton um, that was impacted by pollution. So that is considered a Superfund site. So Lehigh Gap Nature Center is actually partially on a Superfund site, an area of land that was impacted by pollution. So we turned that uh, barren and polluted Superfund site into super habitat, as you will see throughout this video. Okay, but that's all Superfund is. It is a, a law that basically restores areas of land that are impacted by pollution. And in this case, that law is controlling how uh, those 3,000 acres around Palmerton are being restored. Okay, so what makes that so unique though is that Lehigh Gap Nature Center is the only nature center in the country actually on a Superfund site. There are no other nature centers like that. Now, I should point out at this point uh, that the pollution on our Superfund site is not dangerous to people who visit the site. So you'll only be harmed if you actually eat the soil on our property. Uh, which I don't think you'll be very tempted to do, so nothing to worry about there. Now, some Superfund sites have nuclear waste and much more dangerous pollution on them. But in our case, uh, nothing to worry about. Again, I'll explain exactly what types of pollution were involved in our case, um, but nothing to be afraid of. So we hope you will come to the Nature Center and check all this stuff out in person. Uh, so again, though, Lehigh Gap Nature Center is one of a kind, and we have received recognition uh, for being as unique as we are. Um, we received in 2014 the Environmental Protection Agency's Excellence in Site Reuse Award uh, because we creatively restored and reused the Superfund site. Uh, nobody else has done this to this day, but we hope we inspire um, some other people to do what we've done. Okay, now uh, let's jump into our story a little bit here. Um, I want to begin by talking about what the Lehigh Gap actually is. Um, because sometimes people mispronounce our name, people don't quite understand exactly what the Lehigh Gap is. So it's important to understand um, geologically what the gap itself is um, before we get into the human history in the gap, okay? So first of all, what's the Lehigh Gap? Well, I will tell you it is not a gap store in the Lehigh River. We sell clothes at our uh, visitor center at the Osprey House, but not a gap store, sorry. So something else, but it does have to do with that river. The Lehigh River. Uh, the river is about 100 or so miles long, starts up in the Poconos, drains down through um, our area, then down through the Lehigh Valley, meets the Delaware River at Easton. Lehigh Gap has something to do with the Lehigh River. Now you might have heard of the Delaware Water Gap. That's kind of similar, so there's a little hint. But here we go. There is an aerial picture of the Lehigh Gap. That is a good view of the entire gap um, and we'll be seeing images similar to that uh, throughout the video here, but there you go. That's a, a good recent photograph of it. So what's the gap? It is basically a hole in the mountain carved by the Lehigh River. That mountain that you see there looks like two mountains, but it was actually one solid mountain at one time. 
It's called the Kittatinny Ridge. Locally, it's called the Blue Mountain. But the Kittatinny Ridge is over 250 miles long, stretches all the way across southeastern Pennsylvania. Places where waterways, like the Lehigh River, cut through a mountain called the Water Gap. So that is how this gets the name Lehigh Gap. It is the place where the Lehigh River cut through the Kittatinny Ridge. Okay? Kittatinny means endless mountain in the Lenape language. Uh, you can imagine back when the Native Americans were living in this area, uh, it seemed like that mountain went on forever because, again, it stretched all the way across southeastern Pennsylvania. Now, there are five places where waterways cut through this Kittatinny Ridge. Lehigh Gap is one of them, of course. I mentioned the Delaware Water Gap, uh, which is to our east. Then to our west, we have the Schuylkill Gap, the Swatara Gap, the uh, Susquehanna Gap. So there are other rivers that cut through this mountain as well. Um, but ours is very important uh, historically, as was the uh, Schuylkill Gap, as you will see um, in a little bit here. Now, Lehigh Gap Nature Center, of course, we're a nature center inside the Lehigh Gap. We own all the land um, right around the P in the word gap here in this picture. Um, 756 acres total. Uh, about three to 400 acres of that is on the Superfund site itself. Our building uh, is actually off from the distance there um, toward the uh, bridge that you might see crossing the river. Um, so that's where this Osprey House Visitor Center is located. But we own all the land uh, that you see um, just around the P in the word gap there in that picture. So uh, a lot of land. Uh, so a lot of the pictures that you'll be seeing throughout this presentation um, pertain to the region right around that P and you'll see lots of pictures there. But this will give you um, some perspective uh, of where that, that is located when you see these pictures later on in the video. Okay, so uh, now it's time to go back in time a little bit and uh, explore how this landscape has changed over the years as different people have interacted with it. Okay, so um, the Lehigh Gap, uh, was a very beautiful and pristine landscape, as you will see in a second here. But over time, as people have used the land, um, it changed quite a bit. So let's go back to 1812, first of all, in our DeLorean time machine. Uh, this is the oldest image we have of the Lehigh Gap. Uh, this is a wood carving, so of course it couldn't be a photograph in 1812, but it's a wood carving. Somebody sat uh, on one side of the mountain, carved this beautiful image into a piece of wood, used it basically as a stamp, which was uh, reproduced uh, in some sort of publication from that time. Uh, but anyway, what's so valuable about this image is it shows us what the habitat looked like on the mountain back before a lot of changes were made to the Gap area. Uh, you can see there were some people living there at that time, uh, mostly Pennsylvania Germans at that point, some English, Irish, and Welsh. Uh, you know, there, there was a big slate industry nearby here. Um, but for the most part, you know, just scattered settlements, scattered um, villages in the area. Uh, now, another thing worth noting, though, is the type of vegetation that you see on the mountain there. Again, this shows us the habitat that was here at that time. You can see there were a lot of evergreens, a lot of conifers, uh, mostly hemlock and white pine on the side of the mountain. The hemlocks were used for tanning leather, the hemlock bark, um, and those big white pines were used for building uh, ship masts uh, back in colonial times into the early 19th century. So uh, people were using the land, people were using the resources there at that time. Uh, there were even paint mills in the area uh, back in the 19th century. They would harvest rock from the mountain, mine rock. They would use that rock as pigment for making paint, which is why our building, which you see behind me here, is on Paint Mill Road. So people were using the resources in the gap in 1812, um, but you know the, the gap was pretty much still in its semi-pristine natural state at that time. Now, in 1812, again, there were some Europeans living in the area, but there were also still Native Americans in the Lehigh Gap area. This is Chief Lapa Winza. He was the chief of the Lenape Native American tribe, and his people lived here for 13,000 years. We have archeological evidence that shows us this. Uh, and they arrived in a very interesting way. Uh, back up until about 13,000 years ago, there was a glacier on the north side of the mountain. It wasn't right on the north side of the mountain. It was quite a bit north of the Blue Mountain, um, but there's a lot of glacial activity in the area. And because of that, uh, a lot of big animals like bison, elk, woolly mammoth, all those animals that were living in Pennsylvania at that time, they really couldn't get on the north side of that Kittatinny Ridge because there was ice there, there wasn't much habitat, it was pretty barren and rocky. Um, 
really nowhere for them to go. But then as the ice started melting about 13,000 years ago, those animals could pass through the Lehigh Gap, make their way onto the north side of the Kittatinny Ridge, and guess who followed them? Native Americans who were hunting them. They were hunting these big game uh, as they moved north. So that's how the first Native Americans arrived. As the ice melted, those big animals started moving north um, and they followed them. Then the Native Americans stayed because, again, there are lots of great resources in the gap that they were able to use. The Lehigh River, first of all, was used for transportation. Uh, American shad fish migrated up the river uh, every March, so they had a reliable source of food that time of the year. Uh, you know, they used some of the trees in the mountain, they hunted deer and other animals on the land. Um, lots of resources for the Native Americans to use. And as I'll point out later in this video, they even uh, did some farming on our mountain. We have some cool evidence for that, which I'll show toward the end of the video. So Native Americans were here for a long time and most of the history in the Lehigh Gap pertains to them. We can't forget that. Uh, they were here longer than anybody else. Uh, they interacted with the land for thousands of years before the first Europeans arrived. So this is their land um, and we'll be exploring more recent history um, but just know that they were here for a long period of time. That road in front of us here in this picture, uh, it's Route 248 these days, you'll see that in a few other pictures coming up, uh, but that was the Nescapec Path. That was a trail that the Native Americans actually used to pass through the Lehigh Gap. Okay, so some interesting history there, and most of the history of the Gap relates to the Native Americans. Now we have Benjamin Franklin here. He represents the Europeans who came to live in this area. Those are the folks who built these houses that you see in front of us here. Um, and Ben Franklin actually helped to construct a fort on the other side of the mountain, right about where Weissport is today. Uh, and when he was involved with that project, uh, he actually came through the Lehigh Gap, 1756, and he celebrated his 50th birthday right about where the town of Palmerton is today. Of course, Palmerton wasn't there then. Um, Palmerton was built by the Zinc Company, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But, uh, you know, the, right about where Aquashicola is, there were some farms in that area and uh, he celebrated his 50th birthday there when he was involved with uh, building, building those forts. So anyway, uh, we had a few famous people coming through the gap. We have Benjamin Franklin, uh, John James Audubon, the ornithologist came through the gap when he was studying the birds along uh, the Lehigh River area. So a very important transportation corridor as we'll see in a second here. Okay, moving on to 1846. Uh, this is a watercolor painting but it's a pretty cool picture because it shows us what the gap looked like in color back at that time, back before the Civil War still. Uh, you can see the, the mountain was very densely forested at that time. Uh, there were some farm settlements, uh, you know, right about where Palmerton is today, but still not a ton of people living there at that time. Um, notice all the vegetation now. Notice that there, in this picture, you can see some more of those deciduous trees. The other one kind of just showed uh, what looked like a Christmas tree farm. It wasn't quite that, that many uh, conifers at that time. But you can get a good idea, again, of what the habitat looked like. You can also see in this picture why this was a honeymoon reserve, why people came to this area uh, for the scenery, for the beauty. Um, people have long gone to the Delaware Water Gap, too, and they still do to this day uh, for things like that. But the Lehigh Gap was a destination, too. Um, some have even described it as being more beautiful than the Delaware Water Gap at this time. And you can kind of see why in this picture. So notice we have the, the Lehigh River passing through the gap over there in the distance. And closest to us, we have the Aquashicola Creek, which runs alongside Palmerton. Okay. And actually right in this area, uh, for many years, there was a village called Lehigh Gap. Lehigh Gap is not there anymore. Um, that's where 248 is these days. But Lehigh Gap, the village, existed there um, for quite a long time. And um, we have some pretty cool pictures of what that used to look like. Okay, so let's move on now to about 1860. 1860, uh, you can see there's a lot of activity going on in the Lehigh Gap, and all of this related to transporting basically one thing, anthracite coal. Anthracite was discovered on the north side of the mountain, not right here, but up in the coal regions back in the 1790s. But the issue that they had, once they discovered this, great new fuel source, uh, it was hard to get it down to the markets because the coal was mined, you know, in Schuylkill, Carbon, Luzerne counties, places like that. But the factories and all the markets that needed the coal were Philadelphia, New York, New England, places like that. 
it was hard to get the coal from the mines to the factories. So the first effort to do this actually involved the Lehigh River. Um, back in the early 19th century, people would build arcs, little raft-like um, vessels that they would put on, the, put on the river. They would put the coal on those arcs. They would float them on the river and hope that they made it to their destination. But, you know, rivers are very unpredictable. They're high one day, low another day. There are rocks and other types of obstacles. So more often than not, those arcs would get stuck, spill their coal, and they never made it. So a high percentage never made it to their, to their markets, to their destinations. So that didn't work out too well. And that's why by the late 1820s, uh, the Lehigh Canal was constructed. The Lehigh Canal, which you see running alongside the river in this picture here, looks like a creek, but it's actually a, a human-made body of water uh, dug entirely by hand in the late 1820s. Uh, and what this canal allowed them to do was control the water. Since this whole channel was built by people, they didn't have to worry about big rocks or logs or things like that for the most part, uh, and they could raise and lower the water level. So that way they're able to get the coal to the markets much more reliably. Lehigh Canal connected to the Delaware Canal, which went down to Philadelphia. So that's what carried this coal um, all the way down to Philadelphia. All right, so that worked fairly well, you know, it was far more efficient than using those arcs, but uh, the problem was during much of the year, at least, you know, usually October, November through maybe February, March, the water froze. So when that water is frozen, you couldn't transport any coal. So that's why when the invention of the steam engine uh, came along later in history, uh, that kind of started to put that canal system out of business because once we have steam engine trains, like you see in this picture here, you know, in the 1860s from that time on, um, they could haul coal year round. As long as we didn't have, you know, feet and feet of snow blocking the train tracks, they were able to transport that coal. So by the late 1800s, really the, the canal system was kind of obsolete. Uh, it wasn't really nearly as efficient as the trains, so that kind of put them out of business. But we still see remnants of the canal system in the area. If you go to Wallenport, Weisport, um, you can still see um, the actual canal itself. And there's still some signs of it in the gap, but it's mostly gone in that area now. Anyway, uh, so all this had to do with coal transportation. Uh, at one time, there were actually four railroads that went through the gap, uh, three sets of tracks, but actually four for railroads, um, two of the railroads shared one set of tracks. Uh, one of those sets of tracks is remaining today. It's Norfolk Southern that passes through there now, but we still have some train activity. Uh, but all this had to do with coal. Now, why did they carry it all through the Lehigh Gap? Well, it has to do with the fact that there were only five holes in this whole 250 mile long mountain, uh, five water gaps. Uh, and only two of those are close to the coal fields. So imagine back in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, you want to get the coal down to the markets. You have to get through this mountain first. What do you do? Uh, well, you couldn't really dig a tunnel through this mountain back then. That would have been a lot of work. We have a tunnel now by the Nature Center on the Turnpike, but couldn't really do that back then. Uh, really a lot of work to carry the coal over the mountain. So what they did instead was rely on these natural gaps carved by waterways to get the coal through the mountain. So Lehigh Gap and Schuylkill Gap, those two gaps in the ridge were basically the main arteries of coal transportation during the entire Industrial Revolution. Most of the anthracite coal that was transported to the factories at that time during the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, most of that coal went through the Lehigh Gap and the Schuylkill Gap. Pretty amazing. So a lot of the industry and a lot of the history of this country really depended on the Lehigh Gap and the Schuylkill Gap. Uh, has a really important role in history. So I wanted to spend a good deal of time talking about this history because it's very important for what came later on, which we'll see in a second. One more quick note, that bridge in the distance there is called the Chain Bridge, built by a guy named James Finley back in 1826, one of the first suspension bridges in the world, um, built of chains instead of uh, steel cables. Um, you can actually see some of those chains in the park in Palmerton, they're, they're preserved there. Um, but a pre pretty cool technology. It's kind of like a, an early version, a prototype of the Golden Gate Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, but this one stood for over 100 years. Uh, it actually burned down, but it was still pretty structurally sound after that. But nowadays we have a, another bridge at 
that are close by to that location there, which you'll pass over if you visit the nature center. Okay, so that was just a little bit, uh, uh, you know, some industrial history, some transportation history in the gap. And this leads into um, some of the other stuff that we'll be talking about. Real quick here, let's, let's zoom in on some of these different uh, modes of transportation. There's a canal system up close. There's one of the locks that was used to raise and lower the water level. Those boats were pulled by mules because they wanted uh, an animal that had the intelligence of a horse, the strength of a donkey. Um, so that's why they use mules to uh, pull those boats full of coal. Uh, there's a, can uh, a, a canal barge up close. Uh, that little emblem on the side there represents the Lehigh Canal. Uh, there is a steam engine train that basically put the canal system out of business. And then finally, a uh, diesel engine train. And that building you see in the distance there, uh, that is our Osprey house. That's what you see behind me. If you see uh, the picture behind me, um, you know, there's that darker siding right over my head. Uh, that darker siding is on the building that you see in the distance there. It's an old farmhouse, um, actually built around 1870 or so. And as you can see, at one time, trains went right past our back door. Nowadays, that's the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor Trail, the DNL Trail. Um, it's about 165 miles long, and it's very heavily used by bikers, hikers, runners, walkers, etc. cetera. Um, so no trains outside the Nature Center anymore. Um, just a great spot for recreation. All right, so now, with all that in mind, let's go forward to another industry in the Gap. So we talked a little bit about, you know, the paint industry, they harvested trees for certain things. Um, this factory, a lot of people think that zinc was mined in the Lehigh Gap, but there were no mines of that kind in the Gap. The only mines that we really had uh, were quarries in the Lehigh Gap area were the slate quarries down near Slatington. Uh, and then you had some of those uh, uh, paint ore mines near uh, Bowmanstown, places like that. But there was no zinc mine here. And actually, if you drive past Palmerton today, you might see some of the sand quarries up above where this factory used to be. So some people think that's where they got the zinc, but nope, no zinc was ever mined in the Lehigh Gap. Instead, what they did at this big factory was something called zinc smelting. Uh, this was owned by a company called the New Jersey Zinc Company, which you see here. Uh, they relocated from New Jersey back in 1898. And uh, you know they, their factory was built in the mid 1800s in New Jersey, but by the late 1800s, the technology was kind of outdated. So they were looking for a new place to build a factory. Uh, in order to smelt zinc like they did, which I'll describe in a second, they needed two tons of coal to smelt one ton of zinc ore. So they located their factory here um, because they were closer to the coal fields than they were to the ore fields. They needed more coal than ore. So that situation uh, made sense economically. Now, uh, they also located there because of those trains, right? There were already railroads. Uh, there was already a way to get through that mountain um, if they built their factory at that location. So that was another reason they picked uh, this site to, to build their West Plant. So this factory was built in 1898. Um, a little bit later, I'll tell you about their second factory, which they built around 1915. Um, both of those factories did the same smelting process, but they used different types of rocks, which is kind of important, as I will describe. Okay, so. This is the West Plant of the New Jersey Zinc Company, located immediately on the other side of the Lehigh Gap, right across from what is now the Lehigh Gap Wildlife Refuge. You'll see a big flat area right alongside Route 248, where this, this factory used to be. Okay, so a little bit more about what they did there. Uh, so smelting, what is smelting? So uh, this image you see here is from a cartoon, or a video game actually, uh, that kids play called Minecraft. Uh, and you might or might not have heard of Minecraft, but uh, it's actually a useful way to teach young kids about this process that they did at the Zinc Company. Also a good way to illustrate uh, to you viewing at home uh, what smelting is all about. So smelting involves rock, first of all, and this rock was mined from New Jersey, and it was also mined from uh, the area south of Bethlehem that's now where the promenade traps are, uh, a place called Friedensville, actually. So this rock has high concentrations of zinc inside of it. Any kind of rock that has high concentrations of metal that can be used and harvested uh, from that rock, that rock is called ore. So zinc ore, rock with lots of zinc metal inside of it. Now the problem is you can't just make things out of zinc ore. There's a lot of other stuff mixed in with that metal. Uh, so that's why it has to be smelted. Basically all that means is you put the zinc ore inside of a furnace, heat it up to a really high temperature, 
and that metal melts out. Now, what do they use to heat up their furnaces? Well, of course, anthracite coal, as I said before. So they'd bring the coal down from the coal regions. Um, they would bring that ore up from New Jersey and Friedensville, uh, heat the ore up in those furnaces with the coal, melt the metal out, and you were left with something like this. It's called an ingot. Solid zinc metal is what you see there. It's basically a chocolate bar made out of metal. They would uh, melt the metal out of the rock, pour it into those molds, and that's what they were left with. Okay? Then they could use that zinc metal for lots of different things like batteries, film, is used to process film, especially important during the war years, uh, making brass and making paint on aircraft and making munitions like you see here uh, during the war. Palmerton High School, they're still the blue bombers because of that uh, era uh, during the war time. They had a quite a legacy from that, that period of time. So blue bombers kind of, kind of pays homage to that whole history there. So anyway, zinc was an, a very important metal back then, a very important metal today. Um, tires have zinc in them. Um, sunscreen has zinc in it. Lots of everyday objects, everyday items that you use um, contain zinc. You don't even realize it. And New Jersey Zinc Company provided some, or they, they produced some of the highest grade zinc in the entire world. And it's some of the highest grade brass too. So uh, really important factory, especially during the war effort. Um, they, they created really high grade, high quality zinc, some of the best in the world. Okay. Now here's an image from 1912 that shows uh, what the mountain looked like, number one, at that time. But also it shows you what the area started to look like as a zinc company began developing the land. So uh, right in the middle of the screen, so I'll kind of circle it there. Um, right on that middle panel of this picture, you can kind of see the area of land that now makes up our property, Lehigh Gap Nature Center. So you might recognize that section of land from the other images that I've shown you earlier. Uh, then down in the foreground here, uh, right on the bottom right of this picture, you can see where the factory is starting to, to grow. Then the town of Palmerton, there you go, over on the left side, Palmerton existed by 1912. It was brand new at that time, but it was there. So this is what things looked like right after that zinc company was built. So notice there's lots of vegetation on the mountain, really dense forests at that time. Uh, you know, it really hadn't changed too much between uh, that last image I showed you and this point in time. Uh, the forests were still really dense and lush. Um, but Notice that, that there are some changes to the landscape. I will point out one thing before we move on here. Uh, this pile right here uh, next to the zinc company. Uh, and this picture actually does extend over to, this is just uh, three panels of, I think, a five panel panoramic uh, photograph from that time. But this big pile that you see right here is what we call slag. And slag is a waste product from uh, the smelting process, basically. So after you melt the metal out of the rock, slag is what's left behind. So at first they would, they would pile that slag next to the factory, but over time there's got to be so much of it that they began piling it next to the town. If you go to Palmerton today, you will see the slag pile stretches all the way alongside the town, almost half as high as the mountain itself. Um, and it's all that waste product from the, from the zinc smelting process. Uh, kind of interesting. So uh, the Superfund site, interestingly, is broken up into sections because it's so large. Largest Superfund site east of the Mississippi River. Um, one of the sections of the Superfund site is the slag pile. Um, there's a whole effort uh, dedicated to just restoring that section of the Superfund site. Okay, but the slag, you will see that if you drive around Palmerton, it's all over the place. Okay, now let's move on to 1950. By 1950, things changed in the Lehigh Gap, as you see. That dense, lush forest was no longer there. You can see a few trees struggling to survive alongside the river, but for the most part, the vegetation was gone by that time. 2002, the mountain looked like this. Oh boy. And here's one more picture from that time, 2002. So it looked like the moon. It looked like Mars, as I mentioned earlier. This mountain has next to no life on it whatsoever. And you can see the iconic uh, uh, mansion on the Red Hill in the distance there. Um, even that didn't have vegetation anymore. And that was forested at one time too. So the question is now, uh, what happened between 1912 and 2002, and actually between 1912 and 1950, that caused the mountain to die off? What caused it to turn into this moonscape? Because as we saw in those pictures before, the mountain was healthy. The mountain was a beautiful uh, hardwood forest for many years. 
but something changed. What happened? Well, of course, it has something to do with that zinc company. Uh, here's an aerial photograph of the West plant uh, from the late 1930s, actually. A pretty cool image that we have from that time. And as you can see there, you know, there are a lot of emissions, a lot of smoke coming out of that factory. If you burn things, you know, it puts smoke into the air. Uh, and a lot of that smoke that you see there contains something called zinc oxide. Now, at one point in this company's history, they um, had the technology to actually recapture a lot of that zinc oxide. So zinc oxide was a pollutant for a period of time, but it, it uh, you know, was contained after a while. But you can still see it moving across the gap at that time. So air pollution, you can see that that's starting to be an issue here. But, you know, how does air pollution kill vegetation? You know, it's up in the sky, blows away. How could that be an issue? Well, you'll see in a second here. So zinc oxide came out of the West Plant. Uh, but that wasn't the only factory. So here's that zinc oxide coming out of the West Plant. But here comes, uh-oh, some other pollution coming from the other plant that they built. So I remember I said New Jersey Zinc Company built the West Plant in 1898 but they built a second plant around 1915 called the East Plant. That's right about where Aquashicola is today. You'll see there is still a company using their, their old buildings there. Uh, they're just recycling zinc and other metals from, from certain things these days there. So they're not smelting there anymore, but there, there is still an industry based uh, where that factory is located. So you can see where this pollution here originated if you go over there. Uh, so this smoke here, would not really have been white like this. It was kind of a yellowish brown color. Smelled a little bit, kind of like rotten eggs, but not quite. So, you know, there's some kind of sulfur involved. Made your eyes water, made your throat burn. Kind of unpleasant stuff. And that smoke was a little bit different than the smoke from the West Plant because it contained uh, sulfur, as I said before, sulfur dioxide to be, to be exact. Uh, and that's because they were smelting a different ore there. They were smelting what we call sulfide ores. And when you smell sulfide ores, which is zinc ore that has sulfur mixed inside of it, uh, it puts that sulfur dioxide into the air, and that sulfur dioxide mixes with the clouds and forms sulfuric acid precipitation. So that stinky yellowish brown smoke was also responsible for causing the acid precipitation uh, that killed off a lot of the vegetation on the mountain. Now, one more thing that I'll mention at this point, kind of interesting. They built this factory here knowing that the Lehigh Gap would act like an exhaust fan. A lot of that smoke on a sunny day was pulled through the gap and away from Palmerton. It was only on cloudy days when you would have inversions sometimes and the smoke would kind of linger. But on a sunny day, that smoke would go away. Uh, but it was still enough smoke to cause damage to the land here. Um, we had about 65 years of acid precipitation, 1915 to 1980. 1980 is when the smelting operations shut down at the zinc company. They went out of business in that year. But between 1915 and 1980, we had that sulfur dioxide going into the air, sulfuric acid raining and snowing onto the land. Now, how exactly does acid precipitation kill trees though? Kind of interesting. A lot of people think that it burns through the leaves, um, damages the outside of the plant, but that's not really the case. Uh, what It might cause some damage to the outside of the plant, uh, maybe to a degree. But really what happens is the soil gets acidic, of course, as this uh, acid water builds up in the ground. And as soil gets acidic, the nutrients in the ground kind of leach away, they wash away. So what happened was, over time, the nutrients that were inside that soil started to wash away. And it got so deep into the ground that the roots of those trees couldn't reach those nutrients anymore. And they basically starved to death. Now, uh, of course, the trees were still photosynthesizing. They were still making food. Um, but those nutrients in the soil are kind of like the vitamins and minerals in our diet. The trees got very sick and very weak and very unhealthy. And eventually, they just couldn't hang on anymore. So it was that acid rain in combination with the zinc oxide, which was also toxic to an extent um, to those trees, uh, that caused so much vegetation to die off. And it wasn't just our section of the mountain. If you went anywhere between Blue Mountain Ski Resort, which is at Little Gap, anywhere between there and the Lehigh Gap, and then another mile or so beyond that on the other side of the gap, you know, that whole section of the top of the mountain was uh, denuded. It was all uh, barren. It looked like the moon up there. And really, the top of the mountain is what seriously looked like the moon. If you see pictures of the top of the mountain, um, 
you'll realize, you know, just how serious this issue was. And people who hiked on the Appalachian Trail during that time will remember that. They can attest to how, uh, how much it looked like a lunar landscape. The book, A Walk in the Woods, he actually uh, describes that section of the mountain on his hike and uh, just how uh, terrible it looked at that time. So really interesting. Uh, and it's interesting that it was recorded in a book like that too. Anyway, so uh, pretty serious problems we had at that time. Not much vegetation. And then on top of that, when the vegetation dies off, okay, here comes our acid rain. Let's look at that first. Yep, there it goes. Once the acid rain kills off the vegetation, now of course you don't have roots in the ground anymore, uh, holding the soil in place. So soil that took thousands of years since the last ice age to build up all washes away. So there were one to two feet of topsoil on top of that mountain at one time, or on the sides of the mountain. Uh, you know, it took thousands of years to build up, but in just a few decades, those several feet of topsoil washed away. Uh, it washed right into the Lehigh River, gone forever. Uh, can't bring that soil back once it washes away like that. So that's why it looks so barren and so toxic there, uh, because, you know, not even soil on the mountain. You're literally looking at the bones of the mountain. The plants disappeared, the soil washed away, and all you're left with is the rocks that were inside. Okay, and on top of that, there were some other pollutants too. We had zinc, cadmium, lead, copper, heavy metals that fell on the land, settled out from the smoke. Um, and basically what happened there is they made the ground so toxic, so poisonous, uh, that, that the plants couldn't grow back once they died off. So it was mainly the acid rain, acid snow, uh, some of that zinc oxide that killed the vegetation and the heavy metals made it so toxic. Nothing could grow back. And it was so toxic even that once trees died in the gap, they wouldn't decompose. Not even bacteria and fungi could survive inside the Lehigh Gap area here. So uh, it was literally, uh, you know, like uh, a volcanic island. There was no life here for the most part whatsoever. Maybe a few trees that, that would struggle to survive, but that was about it. Okay, so here's a little bit more about what types of pollutants we had there. So 1,500 kilograms of sulfur dioxide per hour at one time coming out of the smokestacks. Uh, 47 tons per year of cadmium. 95 tons per year of lead. Over 3,500 tons per year of zinc. So all those things are raining down in the land. That's what really caused the issue. So who would build a nature center in a place like that? Who in their right mind would put a nature center there. Now you might expect to find a Mars rover there or maybe some Martians like, uh, like these guys here, but uh, you know, you wouldn't expect to find a nature center in a place like that. Who would want to build one there in the first place? Sounds kind of crazy, right? But this is actually an ideal location for a nature center. And there are two reasons for that. First of all, we're on the Kittatinny Ridge, important migratory corridor for birds, but also really important for all kinds of wildlife one of the largest contiguous areas of forest in Pennsylvania. So this is one of the few sections where there wasn't forest. Okay, so lots of wildlife use that mountain, but we're also next to the Lehigh River. So uh, another really important ecological resource. And if we brought this mountain back to life, we wouldn't just be restoring the habitat on the mountain, we'd be protecting that river at the same time. So at this time, you know, there wasn't much nature there, but it's still an ideal location to build a nature center because you're on that Kittatinny Ridge, you're next to the Lehigh River. And one person spearheaded the effort to buy this land, bring it back to life, and create Lehigh Gap Nature Center. And that is Dan Kunkel, who you see at the bottom of the screen here. Dan retired uh, uh, early, actually, from his job as a biology teacher at Freedom High School in Bethlehem uh, to take on this project here. Uh, and for about two decades, Dan uh, coordinated the effort um, to restore the Lehigh Gap Nature Center, um, create our education program, do so many other things. So many, many, many people were involved with this, many volunteers, many experts, uh, but this effort on our property here was coordinated by Dan. He was the, the spearhead. He was the one who drove the bus uh, that led this effort, okay? So this wouldn't have happened without Dan. So just remember that one person can really make a difference, as you'll see um, throughout the rest of this video here. Okay, so back in 2002, Dan and a bunch of other volunteers got together and uh, raised a bunch of money, almost a million dollars, to buy those 756 acres uh, and start to establish the Gap Nature Center. We started as an organization called Wildlife Information Center in Sladington, uh, actually back in the 1980s. Uh, we still are called Wildlife Information Center officially, um, 
but that's where we started on Main Street in Sladington. It had a little storefront place uh, with a library inside. But then back around 2002, they wanted to buy uh, a place to establish an actual nature center. And they looked at a few farms and things and, you know, they were okay. But they realized that they could really do something special uh, if they bought this land and brought it back to life. And that's what made Lehigh Gap Nature Center. Dan, lots of volunteers, lots of experts working together really hard for the past 20 or so years. Dan just retired at the end of uh, 2019 as executive director, but he's now on the board of directors um, as of the making of this video in 2020. Um, so thank Dan if you see him around for doing what he did. Now, here's what he did. Check this out. That same area of land that was barren and dead and polluted looks like this. And it didn't take long for that to happen either. Just a few years from that barren moonscape to turn into this beautiful, lush grassland ecosystem that you see here in this picture. So the rest of this video, I'm gonna talk about how this was accomplished and how the ecosystem on this mountain has come back, okay? So real quick, uh, before we, we move on to the restoration thing, uh, I, I wanted to say a little bit about the zinc company because up to this point, you must think, whoa, boy, that must have been a terrible company. They did all these horrible things to the mountain. They killed off 3,000 acres of land. Must have been terrible. Actually, uh, it's quite the contrary. This company was well ahead of their time from a social and economic standpoint. They uh, made sure all their employees were fairly treated. They made sure everybody had a, a good fair wage. Uh, you know, they had employee benefits long before those things were mandated by law. This company made sure everybody worked during the Great Depression. Uh, you know, they really cared about their employees. The borough of Palmerton, which you see in the background here, did not exist before the zinc company was there. They built that town from the ground up. They built the hospital, brought the best doctors in the world to that hospital. They built all the schools in the town. They built the community centers. They made sure everybody was very healthy, very well educated, because they knew that a healthy and, healthy and educated workforce uh, would be very dedicated to what they did. On top of that, you know, this company actually paid their employees in cash money. And if they wanted to, they could afford to build their own house, buy their own house, or even move out of the town if they wanted to. The people who worked for this company were not in debt to the company. Uh, they could be very independent, and they were very well paid and very well treated. Now, in comparison, uh, just to the north, uh, you know, we had the coal mining industry, not too far away. And here are some uh, child laborers, probably 10, 11 years old, uh, working in the mines. And, you know, I made a point of, of saying that the zinc company paid their employees in cash because that was not the case with the coal mining companies. They paid their employees in something called script, which is basically monopoly money that you could only spend in a company owned store. And who control the prices in the store? The company, right? So uh, these people, uh, these children, their parents, they were constantly in debt to the coal companies. They were exploited by the companies. That was not the case in Palmerton. Palmerton you know, it was a uh, very nice town, still is a very nice town to this day, all because of the zinc company. Um, so, you know, they damaged the landscape, uh, but it was all really a big accident. They did not do that intentionally. It's not something they would have done intentionally because they made great efforts um, to take care of the people and the area here. Uh, and actually a really interesting fact uh, that we learned recently uh, from, uh, the former vice president of research and development for the zinc company, he told us that that company actually controlled 99.5% of their emissions at one point. So it was just a half percent of their emissions that caused this damage. They used the best technology they had available to them at that time, but you know, it wasn't sufficient at that time to uh, control all of their emissions. Um, but we like to think that if they had the technology that we have today, back in 1898, that they definitely would have used it because that's just the kind of company they were. They had a really good culture that cared about the people. Okay, so I always like to point that out uh, before I move on because you know a lot of people like to focus on the negative. They like to focus on all the um, terrible things that occurred because of the smelting process, but we can't overlook the fact that the company really cared about its people. Okay, and again, that was very different uh, than what we had not too far away. Now, a little bit more about the restoration of the Lehigh Gap. How did Dan and everybody else bring this place back to life. So I'm calling this section from super fun to super fun because we went from this picture down here to stuff like this. Now we have all kinds of programs 
Um, you know, 10,000 students a year are educated by uh, Lehigh Gap Nature Center. We have a big uh, trail system, lots of recreational opportunities, lots of great positive things happening here where the Superfund site uh, was formerly barren and dead. Okay, so first of all, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the Superfund law and what that meant for our property here. So according to the Superfund law, um, the company that's responsible for polluting an area of land has to pay for that land to be cleaned up. That's fair, right? Makes sense. But unfortunately, in our case, the company that, that was responsible, that New Jersey's Inc. company, they went out of business in 1980. So even though they were responsible for uh, the pollution on the site, they didn't exist anymore to pay for the restoration of that site. So according to the Superfund law, the uh, company that is basically indirectly responsible, and maybe not even indirectly responsible, they then kind of own the pollution. So let me explain what that means. So back in the 1950s, the New Jersey Zinc Company was bought by a company called Gulf and Western. Gulf and Western became Viacom. Viacom became CBS Television. CBS Television never operated a smelter here. They never had anything to do with the smelting process, but they're now considered the responsible party. Uh, so what that means is all the restoration work that's been done in the Lehigh Gap, which you'll see in the next few minutes, that work is funded by CBS Television. But that is mandated by the Superfund law, which is uh, uh, regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. Okay, so a little interesting history there. Uh, CBS Television paid for all the restoration work. Now, Lehigh Gap Nature Center, we are a nonprofit organization. So all of our education, recreation, all that sort of stuff, pretty much everything except the restoration of the mountain, all that is funded by memberships, donations, grants, things like that. Okay, now a little bit uh, about the, the EPA though. So when the EPA came into the area back in 1983, um, they gave us three rules for, for restoring the Superfund site. And Lehigh Gap Nature Center wasn't involved at that point. So I shouldn't say they gave us the rules, but these were the rules that were established for this Superfund site and specifically for the restoration of the Superfund site. So any landowner who restored a section of the Superfund site had to revegetate with native species. They had to stop that erosion problem that was occurring on the property. And they had to fix the metals in the soil so they weren't mobilized into the food chain. Those are the three rules, what EPA calls a record of decision for the Superfund site. Um, any type of restoration work that was done on the property had to follow those three rules, okay? So one of the first restoration efforts was behind uh, the east plant of the zinc company. Um, it was a company called Horsehead Resources that operated out of that factory at that time. And um, that's where the, the zinc recycling facility is today. But again, no smelting took place at that time, although there was a metal company called Horsehead that operated there at that time. So uh, 1983, the Superfund site was established, but 1990 is when the first restoration efforts began. And this is what it looked like. It was called the Eco Loam Restoration. And what this involved was carving miles of roads into the side of the mountain, switchback roads so you could drive all along the side of the mountain. Uh, and again, this is all over the area behind the east plant of the zinc company, right behind Aquashikla. You can see this if you drive through Aquashikla. What they did here, though, after they carved the roads, is they would spread a uh, combination of grass and tree seeds with uh, sewage sludge and fly ash from electrical power plants. That was their, their soil, their, their uh, soil amendment that they included with the seed mix. Uh, and they spread that all across the mountain. And as you can see here, it, it turned green pretty quickly. Uh, it grew back. Uh, a lot of the things that they, they planted grew. Um, there were also tomatoes, I hear, that came out of the sewage sludge because apparently our digestive systems don't break those seeds down. But anyway, uh, enough about that for now. Uh, you know, the, the plants that they planted there did fairly well. But the problem was they didn't do much management on uh, the eco loam area there. So uh, not too long after they planted all these trees and grasses, invasive species started to take over the area. Butterfly bush, which a lot of people don't realize is invasive, but it's invasive. Uh, Tree of heaven and a bunch of other uh, invasive species. They started to take over that entire area. As we know now, Tree of heaven is the host plant of the spotted lanternfly, which is an invasive insect that's coming into our area. So, uh, you know, we don't want invasive plants like that in the area for reasons like that and for many other reasons. So um, even though they planted lots of different stuff there, um, pretty quickly, it was nothing but invasive species for the most part there. So it worked in making the mountain green, but it didn't work uh, toward all these goals that, that uh, EPA established. 
Okay, so let's go back to uh, what we did now. So we learned from their mistakes, kind of, uh, you know, what they did at the Ecolum site, and we tried to uh, make some improvements on that. So it's great that they did this because it provided um, some background that helped us when we bought our section of the Superfund site back in the early 2000s. So what we did a little differently is we looked at something called ecological models. We use nature to guide what we did. Uh, so we looked at conditions similar to our property and looked at what was growing there because we thought if they grew well in similar conditions, they might grow on our property. So the first condition was post-glacial Pennsylvania. Back in post-glacial Pennsylvania, that post-glacial period, uh, was very dry, very rocky, very barren. And what were the first plants to grow back after those glaciers receded? Well, it was native warm season prairie grasses, okay? Grew well then, we thought they might grow well on our property because we had a very dry and rocky uh, condition too. But that wasn't the only condition we looked at. We also looked at a place called the Serpentine Barrens uh, in southeastern Pennsylvania. This is an area around Chester County where the soils have naturally high metal concentrations. So what do you think grew there? Well, luckily it was actually the same grasses, those very same grasses that grew in post-glacial Pennsylvania. So we figured if they grew well under both of those conditions, they would probably do well on our property, but we weren't sure. It was all just uh, a lot of conjecture at that point, a lot of hypothesizing um, at that point in time. Um, you know, again, those warm season grasses, they were soil builders in post-glacial Pennsylvania. Those are the things that came back uh, right after the glaciers receded, habitat was starting to, to come back into the area. Those are the first things to come back. But again, also the predominant species in the serpentine soil. Okay, and here's just a, a little bit of a, an overview of what they look like, what they do. So again, they grow mineral soils, they stabilize slopes really well, they don't absorb the metals, they build soils, uh, they also tolerate drought, uh, provide all kinds of habitat. They evolved with fire, which will be important as you see in a little bit. So these grasses have all those traits in addition to growing well in those conditions that I just mentioned a, a second ago here. So that made them perfect for our property because they don't just grow well uh, in the Lehigh Gap area. They also meet all these goals that the EPA set for our property. They're native species, but they also control erosion because they have root systems that go sometimes 10 feet below the soil and hold the mountain together really well. They form dense networks of fibrous roots uh, below the ground. So they address that problem. But then they also lock away those metals. Uh, you know, they don't pull them into their leaves in high concentrations. Some plants do, as we'll see in a little bit, but those kind of leave the metals under the ground. But on top of that, these grasses decompose above ground after every growing season, but they also decompose below ground. Some of the root system dies off after every growing season. And this creates new clean topsoil, both above and below the metals. So that means that uh, those metals are being sandwiched between a growing layer of topsoil above the ground and a growing layer below the ground. So the, the soil is growing this way, the metals are getting trapped in between, and they're being capped underground. They're being locked away naturally. Uh, it's pretty cool. It takes about 50 years for an inch of topsoil to grow in a grassland. It takes about 100 for that to happen in a forest. So it's happening much more quickly with these types of plants than it would if we planted trees. Okay, so these prairie grasses solve all of our problems. Pretty cool. Uh, grow well in these conditions, solve the problems, they are perfect. Uh, but how do you grow these things on a moonscape? It's not like you can just throw seed uh, on a place like this and expect it to grow. Even though these did grow in really similar conditions, they needed some help. So that's why we had to do a lot of experiments to see just what worked the best for them. So back in 2003, we planted uh, 56 one acre test plots on the side of the mountain. And these test plots are where we did uh, our experiments. We, we experimented with different types of combinations of seed and soil amendment. Uh, and here's what we did. We had to fix the soil, of course, and we already knew certain things were needed. We knew um, from some studies back in the 70s that needed four tons of limestone uh, per acre of land to make the pH uh, good enough for these seeds to germinate. You know, the pH in some sections of our property was 4.3 back in, in the early 2000s. If that soil pH went down to 4.0 or lower, the metals in the soil would have dissolved and gone into the groundwater. That would have caused all kinds of terrible issues. So we had to put four tons of limestone down per acre 
four tons of crushed pelletized lime um, to bring that pH back up to a reasonable level so the seeds could germinate and so we didn't have to worry about um, you know those uh, metals leaching into the groundwater. So we knew about the limestone, that was a given, four tons per acre. Uh, we knew we needed fertilizer, we knew which combination, what amounts we needed for, for the seeds to, to germinate. Uh, so that wasn't an issue either. What we really wanted to experiment with in this case was compost. We didn't know what type of compost would work best. So as far as soil amendment, uh, we were really experimenting just with the compost. Uh, and here you go, you can see kind of what we, what we use. So we had a set amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, fertilizer, we had that set amount of limestone, but here are the different types of uh, compost that we experimented with. Mushroom compost, Lehigh County, municipal waste, duck and turkey manure, sewage sludge like they used on the Ecolome area, uh, straw mulch, um, all those different things were, were tested. It turns out mushroom compost worked the best, so that's what we ended up using. Uh, but we tried everything uh, just to see what, what was most effective and most cost effective too. Okay, and then on top of that we had to plant our super grasses, those uh, native warm season grasses that grow well here and meet all those EPA goals. Um, so here's what they look like. I'll show a few more pictures, some examples in a second here, but notice those deep fibrous roots that go underground. That's actually just a young, uh, recently germinated seed right there. So uh, those roots go much deeper than that under the ground, sometimes as deep as the deep end of a swimming pool. Um, so that holds the mountain together very well, but you can see how fibrous those roots are. You can see there how tall those grasses go. That's Dan there. So notice these grasses are much different than the turf grasses you might have in your backyard at home. Um, they're not, they don't grow in mats. They don't have those real shallow roots. They're really tall, have those deep root systems. They grow in clumps, provide all kinds of good habitat for wildlife. So pretty cool grasses. Okay, and these are what we experimented with in our test plot. So we planted some warm season grasses. We also tried some cool season grasses. Those are the uh, turf grass type grasses that you might have in your yard probably some different species than you have in your yard. Uh, but the purpose of the cool season grasses was to kind of stabilize the mountain quickly because they would grow in much cooler conditions before these grasses could germinate, before these warm season grasses could germinate. Um, so we did have some cool, cool season grasses in the mix too, but our main focus was determining what combination of warm season grasses uh, would grow most effectively on the property. So these are some of the species that we tried out, okay? And I'll show you some pictures in a sec. Uh, we were told none of this would ever work. We were told that uh, you know nothing could grow there again because it was so toxic and so barren for so long. But the grass didn't know that. It grew back right away. And uh, this is just a little cartoon, but let me show you what actually happened. So here's 2002. Here's our dead, toxic, barren section of the Kittatinny Ridge. Just two years later, check this out. There you go. Didn't take long to create this thriving grassland. The grass grew extremely well, even better than we had anticipated. Uh, and this is similar to what you will see at the Nature Center if you visit there in the summer these days. Okay, so that's what we used. Um, now, uh, here's another comparison. This is just from, again, the experimental plots from those test plots, but 2002 versus 2003, 2004. There's another one. And here, we created this thriving grassland ecosystem in just two years. That's what it looked like. Okay, we had to do monitoring along the way though. Um, you know, EPA, in addition to having those large goals, part of that record of decision, they also have benchmarks that we have to meet uh, after a certain number of years. We have to have certain, a certain percentage of the land covered with vegetation, uh, you know, lots of different benchmarks that we have to meet. And in order to assess how close we are to meeting those, we have to do research constantly on the site. So here is uh, a total cover analysis uh, taking place back in the early 2000s. They're basically just seeing, you know, which combination of uh, amendment and grass seed covered the most ground, you know, because EPA wanted to have lots of area or lots of ground revegetated. They want to have as much revegetated as possible, but in order to determine what worked best, you had to do this, this type of study, uh, like you see here. Okay, and then came the challenge of planting the steep part of the mountain. How do you get grass way up on top? So it was easy to spread the seed uh, at least relatively easy easy on, on, on the lower slopes of the mountain. You can use those tractors with spreaders, just dump the mix of soil and amendment, or soil amendment and, and seed in the back of those tractors and spreaders. Just spread it around, it wasn't an issue. Uh, but then when we got to the steep parts, obviously the tractors couldn't really drive up there. So we had to be a little more creative. So it turned out that, uh, you know, we had 
this type of technology available to us. Uh, and it worked really well. These are crop duster airplanes. These are what you would use typically to, to spread uh, pesticides or something around a farm. But we put them to better use, I think, uh, by spreading the seed and soil on top of the mountain. Now, we couldn't put the entire mix of soil inside those crop dusters. We can only uh, uh, put the pelletized limestone because it's a little too heavy with everything. But we determined that the limestone and seed was really all it took to uh, revegetate the upper slopes. Now, you'll see, um, if you visit there today, there's some sections up on top where there's still nothing growing. That's just because it was too steep. Uh, the seed kind of washed into the cracks in the rocks and wasn't able to germinate. But uh, over the next few years, we're going to be working on actually uh, planting some of those sections too. Okay, so there you go, 2004. We experimented with our crop duster seeding on the steep slopes of the mountain. Uh, and then full scale planting started in 2006. So that included the um, crop dusters on the steep slopes and then the tractors and spreaders on the lower slopes of the mountain. Okay. And these are the species that we ended up planting. Mostly things like big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, gamma grass, all the things you see listed here. Um, and I will show you some pictures here now. So Eastern gamma grass, there you go. Uh, again, if you visit the nature center, look out for all these different types of grasses. Uh, big blue stem called turkey foot because of the, the way the uh, seed heads are, are shaped. Little blue stem, switch grass, wild rye, Canada wild rye. There you go, Indian grass. And here's how the mountain changed. So I should do this picture earlier, but I'll show you again. There's 2007, 2008. And this is basically what the mountain looks like in the summertime nowadays. It really hasn't changed all that much. We want to maintain a grassland there because this type of restoration has worked so well. Okay. Now there's a lot of management that has to be done on our property. And again, this is something that wasn't done on that Ecolom site early on. Um, but we have to do this management because otherwise we'd be left with nothing but invasive species, just like they were over there. So we've had to fight off butterfly bush, tree of heaven, just like on the Ecolum area. Uh, but we also have another issue that you wouldn't really expect. So naturally, when you plant grasses or when you have, uh, you know, an abandoned farm field or something like that, gradually over time that ecosystem is going to change. That's something that we call succession, ecological succession. Some species will replace others and others will replace those and the ecosystem matures over time. So naturally what would happen in this case when we have a grassland like this is gray birches, aspens, and early successional species of that type uh, would normally take over. You know, we would have uh, usually a gray birch forest filling in this area after that and then those, those trees would be replaced by other trees. And eventually we'd end up probably with an oak forest or something like that in this area. Uh, but the problem is we can't allow that natural progression to occur in our property. And that's because these early successional trees, these gray birches and aspens, they pull those heavy metals out of the soil and concentrate them in their leaves. Uh, that's bad for, for two reasons. First of all, if the leaves fall off every autumn, they're putting the metals back on top of the ground. That's not good. EPA doesn't want that. But also if a caterpillar eats these leaves, breeds that caterpillar, that bird flies to South America to spend the winter time, it can carry those metals far beyond our property. So not a good thing. Uh, and that's why we have to control these trees, even though they're native trees that are growing back naturally through ecological succession. Um, these trees are not what we want on our property because it goes against one of those goals uh, that's in the original record of decision um, that was presented by EPA back in the 80s. So, we have to control these trees because they do not fit that uh, set of goals that EPA established. So how do we do that though? How do we control these early successional trees and how do we control those invasive species, those uh, butterfly bushes, those tree of heaven? How do we control all these things at the same time while maintaining the grassland? So we want to kill these trees that we don't want and these shrubs, but we want to also at the same time maintain our grassland. So how do we do all that? at the same time. Well, over the past few years, we've done one sort of uh, management practice, as you'll see here in a second, but we're not doing that right now. It's kind of on hold for the time being. Uh, you know, we're reassessing that, it's expensive, and we're looking at other things. But here's what we've been doing for the past few years. Prescribed fire. 
believe it or not, grasses love fire. I think I mentioned earlier, um, they evolved with fire. So that means after a fire passes through a grassland like this, the grasses actually thrive because a fire, uh, you know, releases all kinds of nutrients into the soil. Once that charred material uh, breaks down from all the trees and grasses that were there, it puts a surge of nutrients into the ground and the grasses do extremely well. The fire doesn't kill off the root system, just kills off what's above the ground and, you know, then those nutrients go into the roots and, and they do very well. But the trees, on the other hand, don't do so well. The sap boils inside of the trees and the shrubs and they die off entirely. So we lose our birches and aspens, we lose our invasive species like the butterfly bush and the tree of heaven, uh, but the grasses do extremely well. Now again, prescribed fire is expensive and CBS uh, is reconsidering it because it's expensive. Uh, so we're looking at other alternatives to this. And something that we're thinking about doing now and which we've actually begun testing is something called leapfrogging succession. And this method involves planting later successional species, planting things that wouldn't usually show up until uh, you know, a few hundred years maybe, in some cases, maybe a few decades, it depends on the ecosystem. But we're thinking about planting things like oaks, maples, trees like that, maybe pines, things that wouldn't come, on, come along until much later on. Because what's, what's unique about uh, those trees, maybe not unique, but, but what's beneficial about those trees is they don't take the metals out of the soil like the earlier successional trees do. These birches and aspens are what we call hyperaccumulators. They pull lots of metals out of the ground, but those later successional species do not do that quite as much. So, uh, you know, if we uh, plant those trees in the property, they won't be taking the metals into their tissue, uh, but the issue is uh, that they're actually sterile. They won't be able to reproduce. Uh, you know, an oak tree that grows in this environment, it might make acorns, um, but those acorns won't really germinate. And if they do germinate, they won't survive. So um, we're thinking about creating some forest for those later successional trees, but it's still not the perfect solution. Uh, really, these grasses are the best thing. Okay, so just thought I'd point that out real quick because we have done prescribed fire, but thinking about doing other things uh, moving forward. And that, that leapfrogging succession technique was actually used on other sections of the Superfund site. Not everybody on the Superfund site took the same approach to restoring the land. Because again, as long as you restore within EPA's guidelines, if you follow their rules, um, you are good. Uh, you know, the National Park Service, which owns the land running alongside the Appalachian Trail, they decided to plant trees instead of uh, only grasses like we did uh, on, their, on their section. Uh, of the Superfund site. And that's because they have a policy that says that their land has to be returned to its original ecological state um, if there's some sort of disturbance. And uh, 150 years ago, there was an American chestnut in oak forest up on top of the mountain. So along the National Park Service land, they actually did plant uh, about 13 to 15,000 trees, uh, which were um, actually placed in holes that were hand dug on top of the mountain. They put the soil amendment inside that and uh, plant those trees there. So the point is, uh, there are lots of ways to restore a Superfund site. All has to be approved by CBS and EPA, um, but lots of different things have been done on our property. But that leapfrogging succession is something we're thinking about doing at Lehigh Gap Nature Center uh, in the future. Here we go. Let's just take a look at how good the fire is for this grassland though. So here is a, a fire that was uh, uh, done back in April of 2013, that was the first uh, test burn that we did, I believe. Um, and we usually did our burns in April and November, right around that time, you know, right before the growing season and right toward the end of it. Um, but when you do a burn, the conditions have to be just right. So sometimes we wouldn't know until the day of uh, if the conditions were, were right for the burn. So there's a lot that's involved with this process. And there are experts who are involved with this process too. That's why it is expensive. Uh, you know, they're insured to do what they do. They're, they're good at what they do. Um, so it's an expensive process, but very effective. Let me show you. So April 25th, 2013, this is what our grassland looked like right after the burn. Here's what it looked like on May 2nd, May 17th, June 5th, June 14th, July 9th. So notice how tall these grasses are and how quickly they came back. And if you look at some of these pictures, maybe this one here, you look in the background there, you'll see that some of those grasses that were not burned um, are not quite as tall. They're not doing quite as well. 
Uh, so it's interesting to compare sections of our grassland that were burned with sections that were not burned because the ones that were burned grow back much better, much taller, uh, and much more quickly. Okay, now uh, after we did all that other work though, you know, after we established the grassland, once we developed our management plan, you know, doing prescribed burns and things like that, uh, we had to think about um, how this ecosystem was changing over time. So along with all that other work that we did, we started doing a lot of research uh, on the property. One of the most important research efforts that we, we did was this thing called the ecological assessment, which began back in the uh, late, 2000, late 2000s, you know, early around 2010, right around there. Um, that involved basically inventorying uh, what types of species we had in our property early in the restoration history of our site. So uh, this, what you see here is phase two. There was an earlier phase that took place, um, you know, more recently after we started our, our restoration efforts. Um, but here's what they discovered. And I'll, I'll just highlight some of these things. So uh, the ecological assessment identified and mapped 23 plant communities, recognized a savanna, which I'll point out later, um, documented vernal ponds and wetlands, identified over 400 plant species, including four that are listed as threatened or endangered in Pennsylvania. Identified 48 lichen species compared to five in 1974. This is important because lichens are sensitive to air quality. Back in the 1970s when the zinc plant was still in operation, air quality wasn't great, so only five species of lichen. But now, uh, back in 2010 when this study was completed, 48 species, uh, over 800 insect species, over 150 plus bird species, mammals and reptiles, amphibians, spiders, all kinds of things. All these things were studied. Uh, you know, we documented stewardship issues and priorities. The goal of this project here was to inform the future management of the property. Because if we have baseline data like this, we can study how the site changes over time. Okay, and there were lots of people involved with this. Lots of colleges and universities, lots of researchers from uh, government agencies, um, CBS Television, of course the Environmental Protection Agency, everybody was involved. But all this research is intended to inform us on how to best manage the site going forward. So is prescribed burning the best? Is um, leapfrogging succession better? Well, as we start to think about those things, we will keep all the data from this study in mind. Okay. And immediately after we did these studies, um, at least the first phase, we started to think about what species we could add to enhance the grassland. So we added some wildflowers, like you see here, um, to attract more pollinators to the site. And uh, we added some nest boxes and things too. There were some other habitat enhancements that we made to the property. Um, and a few more we added 2009 uh, based on more of our research. Uh, and a lot of volunteers are involved with the uh, planting efforts over the years, as you see here. Okay, uh, but we are continuing this research to this day. We still have lots of partnerships with colleges and universities, government agencies. Uh, we're all working really hard to study how this site changes over time. Because again, it's very unique. Nobody has ever done anything quite like this. And uh, the data that we collect can be important, not just for EPA, um, but for other people um, who are restoring sites or doing research like this. Now, as you can imagine, wildlife has returned to our property since we've done our restoration work. Uh, some of the first things that come back were insects. Uh, we had beetle larvae and uh, you know centipedes and millipedes and things like that showing up and grasshoppers eating the grasses and then we had Predatory insects like this uh, praying mantis showing up. That's actually a non-native invasive species, Chinese mantis. Um, but the fact that we saw them showed that, you know, there are enough insects lower in the food chain for, for a predator to show up like that. Then we have birds like tree swallows, bluebirds, kestrels. Those are all birds that will hunt in the grassland like we have. Uh, even blue grosbeaks, a species not common in Pennsylvania. They've been nesting on our property for a few years because the habitat is just right. Then we have birds like these, uh, you know, common night hawks that hunt around uh, the mountainsides, they'll actually nest on top of the mountain. And they have little babies that look like that. <laughs> real cute, real fluffy. Uh, you'll know if you're around a baby because the mom will let you know. Uh, but anyway, lots of different things. You know, and these, these enhancement species like black-eyed Susans attracted butterflies of different kinds. A lot of monarch butterflies pass through the area. Regal fritillary is a type of butterfly that's endangered in Pennsylvania, only occurs in one place, but we have habitat that's just about right for them. Just have to plant a few violet species to attract them to our property. So maybe someday we'll have those there too. We even have endangered species on our property. Wild bleeding heart, a plant that's only found in the Palmerton area and a place called Manaka, where 
coincidentally, they also had a zinc smelter. So something about uh, zinc, uh, you know, is good for this plant. We don't know what that relationship is, why they grow well in zinc contaminated soils, but they do. Uh, and then sandwort really only occurs in the Palmerton area, nowhere else in Pennsylvania. So pretty cool to have these endangered plants growing on the Superfund site. And they grew even before we started our restoration efforts. Now I'll end by just pointing out some of the other habitats that we have. So of course, we're next to the Lehigh River. We have these wooded slopes, wetlands, ponds, all these things provide habitat. But it's the species we see there that tell us that this ecosystem is recovering. Migratory uh, neotropical birds like uh, the scarlet tanager you see here. We have all kinds of birds coming through the property now that we did not see for many years. Wood ducks and other types of uh, waterfowl that, that feed out of the ponds and the river. They couldn't have survived there uh, not that long ago because in addition to the land being dirty, you know, the, the waterways were polluted too. All that soil that eroded up the mountain went to the river, um, you know, carried all kinds of pollutants with it, plus lots of other pollution in the river and, and even in the ponds. So the fact that we see these types of creatures there now, it's a good sign that that ecosystem is recovering. Okay, even the Lehigh River area, you know, the, the river's really uh, recovering very nicely. We see birds like uh, this common merganser in the river these days. Um, but I'll point out that this area of vegetation alongside the river, what we call the riparian zone to the Lehigh River, um, that was missing for many years. Uh, you know, when the canal system and the trains were there, they actually removed the uh, riparian zones oftentimes. Uh, and when the land is polluted, obviously the riparian zones couldn't really grow that well. Um, but in the years, uh, you know, since the zinc company shut down, the riparian zone started to recover on its own in some, some areas. Some of our work has helped to restore it a little bit. Um, but nowadays that riparian zone is, is doing its job filtering runoff that comes off of the land. If you have an area of vegetation growing alongside a river or stream like this, it acts as a buffer. We call it a riparian buffer because it catches runoff, filters that water, prevents flooding, things like that. So it's doing its job again, uh, filtering the water, preventing flooding, and um, as a result of that, we have all kinds of wildlife in the river now. And if we have a duck like a common merganser living inside the Lehigh River, that means that the river is clean enough to have, you know, uh, phytoplankton, algae at the bottom of the food chain, then macroinvertebrates, larval insects that eat that, and then fish eating that, and then these ducks come along and eat the fish. And we even have bald eagles there these days. That's how clean the water is. Ospreys too, hunting fish out of the river. So uh, all good signs that all of the ecosystems, not just the land, but the aquatic ecosystems, the ecosystems are recovering too. Okay, uh, we have seeps and springs all alongside the mountain, especially when it rains a lot, like it, like it has been this spring. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of water draining out of the mountain, but that attracts migratory birds like these here. Uh, a lot of people ask if that water is drinkable. Um, there are no heavy metal issues in the water. Uh, the water has been tested over the years and monitored. Um, only thing, you know, just like any open body of water that could be um, living organisms that could make you sick, but that's not unique to our site. That, that goes with any area of water that's, that's open like that. Okay, now here's something that I, I think I alluded to a few times throughout here, um, our savanna. So again, this is uh, something that was recognized by our ecological assessment, uh, but this also is a uh, remnant of the Native American culture that existed here for thousands of years. About 10,000 years ago, Native Americans started farming. Uh, and this is one of the areas of land that they began farming. Now we don't know exactly when they started farming the top of the mountain here, but we know that they did it for a very long time. Hundreds if not thousands of years, they, they farmed the top of the mountain. And we know that because of the savanna here. Uh, you know, we, originally we thought that the savanna was formed from the pollution. Uh, we thought that this was just impacted by the emissions just like everything else was. But the guy you see in the background there, John Dickerson, he's a, a grassland expert who helped with a lot of our restoration work. He recognized that this was an area of land that was farmed by Native Americans. Basically what happened was the Native Americans were trying to grow berries like blueberries, huckleberries, stuff like that. Um, but those plants need lots of sunlight to grow. Uh, so in order to provide the right amount of sunlight for these plants to grow, they would have to burn the forest down over and over and over again. And they actually burned the forest so many times uh, that the trees stopped growing back. Uh, and you know, nowadays we have nothing but grasses, shrubs, and maybe a few trees scattered about up there. Um, but that's what created that savanna. The Native Americans actually farming on top of the mountain. 
pretty cool, right? And actually, uh, a lot of people uh, from the Palmerton area, um, especially the older generations, will remember people continued to grow blueberries or pick blueberries in the mountains even long after uh, the Native Americans stopped farming up there. Uh, pretty neat. I wouldn't recommend eating the, the berries because they could have some zinc in them, but a berry or two might not hurt, but I don't recommend it because they're, they're, there is metal inside the soil on top of the mountain. And any plant in the area might take up some concentrations of metal. So again, don't eat the soil, and I don't recommend eating any berries on or around our property either. Okay, so anyway, uh, that is our savanna. It is actually considered the largest natural grassland in Pennsylvania. Technically not natural, I guess, because people were still responsible for its creation, um, but people haven't been managing it for a very long time. So I guess at this point it is considered natural. So uh, a really important uh, ecosystem that we have on our property. Okay, a uh, few more things uh, before we wrap up here. Uh, if you drive through the Lehigh Gap, you'll probably see these cool uh, rocky outcroppings. That one up on top there is called Devil's Pulpit. It's had that name for a very long time. About 100 or so years ago, uh, it was the nesting site for peregrine falcons, actually. Fastest animal in the world. Uh, and these animals uh, declined, uh, you know, during the DDT era, just like bald eagles did. Their, their eggshells thinned. Um, they weren't able to hatch. Um, and their population really decreased substantially. But in recent decades, their population has been going up. Uh, we operate a hawk count too. We've actually been doing that since the 60s. So we've been monitoring their populations and they're going up, which is a good thing. Um, but we're hoping that someday they will nest on the pulpit or somewhere else in the area again. Um, because these rocky outcroppings are natural. They existed there even before uh, the vegetation died off. Uh, so we're hoping that they will come back and nest there again, because that'd be pretty cool to have a bird that was almost all gone um, nesting in the Lehigh Gap again. All right, and one of the last habitats that you'll see around the Nature Center is this scrub habitat, which occurs under the power lines. Uh, now, power companies have to maintain vegetation under the power lines. And actually, in our case, we do the work for them. Uh, usually, you know, we, we cut down the trees because trees aren't allowed to grow under the power lines, but that allows certain other plants to grow there, things like meadow sweet, uh, you know, a lot of other shrubs and grasses. And that creates this kind of unique habitat that we call scrub. And that's great for birds like uh, indigo buntings, prairie warblers, they love places like that. So even the areas under the power line uh, give us an opportunity to create habitat um, for certain types of species. And even our building sometimes hosts uh, certain species of birds. This is a Female common merganser used to nest inside the chimney. Now we have a nest box where they nest on the side of the building. Um, but even the osprey house attracts wildlife. Pretty cool. So <laughs> that's all I have uh, on the history of the Lehigh Gap. A lot of information I know. So I will put our contact information up at the end of this video, as I always do. If you have any questions about any aspects of our history, our story here, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, the ecological assessment that I showed is available on the website, um, as is uh, some other information about our history. Uh, but any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, and, and thank you for watching this video. Hopefully you made it all the way to the end. I know it's a long one. Um, but uh, until next time, everybody, please take care and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next video.